Hey everybody, welcome and thank you so much for tuning in to the Wayward Outreach Sermon. We really believe this sermon is going to bless you, so stick around and watch. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Give the Lord a praise. Look at your neighbor and say, you look better today than you did last week. You may be seated. How many of you know you have some world-class, world-shaking pastors? You got some of the greatest pastors in the world. Wherever they're at today, we pray abundance and blessing upon them. Amen. Amen. We're going to get right into the message today because we've got a word for you. And if you notice, I wore my safari shirt, so we'll get to the safari at the end. Okay? You'll understand more when we get there. I want to talk to you today about how the devil operates. I want to expose him a little bit and tell you how to whip him. Is that all right? I think the devil overcomes most of us because we really don't quite understand his nature. Let me tell you something about the devil. He's never a good guy. He always is a liar. He always slanders and he always accuses. He's always divisive. He's always trying to divide you from redemptive relationships. Let me explain to you what a redemptive relationship is. A redemptive relationship is a relationship that you have that helps you to stay away from error or from evil. Now there's four basic redemptive relationships in our lives. The first one is with God. How many of you know you can't be saved without Jesus Christ? He's redemptive and so so, so, uh, that's a redemptive relationship. The second is your marriage. And God wants us to have a covenant bond with our wives, our husbands, and have a beautiful marriage. And and I'll I'll also extend that a little bit to say with our children, our families. The third redemptive relationship is our church and godly relationships with one another. And the fourth redemptive relationship is with authority. So let me say it this way. God's will is for everybody to have an intimate relationship with him. God's will is is for every marriage to be in a covenant bond and be healthy and strong and our children to flourish. God's will is for every one of us to have a strong Bible-believing church and be a part of it. And God's will is for every one of us to have right relationship with all authorities that would be in our life. The devil's will is to separate you from God, divide you from God, is to break down and at your marriage and your home so that there's no commitments, there's no faithfulness, there's no love. His will is to get you outside of a church and to be without a church. And his will is to tear down your understanding or your relationship with any authority figure that might be in your life. And that's exactly what we see happening in our country today. We have people today that, that, that the devil has divided us. We, we, don't, we can't trust our pastors. We don't trust our churches. We don't trust our husbands. We don't trust our wives. We don't trust anybody around us. And we really, when it gets down to it, sometimes we don't even trust God. And so the devil's job has always been to divide us, to make us stand alone, to get us separated. Amen. God created us to need him. He created us to need one another. When God created the earth, he said, when he got done as he was looking at things, he said, it is very good. But one place he did not say it was very good. When he looked down, he saw a man by himself standing alone. And he said, that's not good. Because God has made us to be connected. So the devil comes, listen carefully as I start to lay the groundwork, to slander, to accuse, to lie, to tear down any kind of relationship you might would have with God your family, your church, or an authority. That's his, that's his whole design in this thing is to tear it down. The devil's favorite target is your mind. As a man thinks, so is he. He attacks the mind. I want you to listen to this as I begin to work with you today. Second Corinthians 10, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now what's this word? Casting down arguments. Everybody say arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It says to bring every one of those thoughts, those arguments, into captivity to the obedience. Everybody say obedience. Obedience. Of Christ. And being ready to punish disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So here's what happens. The enemy creates an argument in your mind. For example, you're reading the Bible or you're listening to a preacher 
and they bring up God's love. The first thing that happens in your mind is, yeah, but God can't love me because there's the argument. He starts to argue with you why you're not qualified to be loved, why you're not qualified to, to have a good marriage, why you've messed up everything so bad that nothing can happen. And so the devil starts arguments. If God loves you so much, then why are you so poor? Why don't you have this? Why don't you have, it's an argument. Now the Bible says that you have to take every one of those arguments, those thoughts captive, and you have to bring them into captivity. So if you don't take the thought captive, the, cap the thought will take you captive. Now the word obedience there is like this. It's to, it literally means at spear point. So it's like this, you're at a gate, you're guarding the gate. It's the gate to your mind, the gate to your world. Here comes a thought, you take a spear, you put it under its neck, you challenge it and you interrogate it. You interrogate every argument, every thought. Is the thought dividing you from God? Is the thought dividing you from your marriage, your home? Is it dividing you from your church? Is it accusing your wife? Is it accusing your teenager? Is it accusing your pastor? Is it accusing the President Trump? Oh, we're gonna get there. Every thought has to be brought to interrogation. Every thought, if it's there and it's accusing, does that sound like God? Think it through. Every thought, if you don't take the thought captive, the thought will take you captive. So there are rogue thoughts that come into our mind, okay? You're supposed to take every thought and put it into interrogation. Is this dividing me? Is this separating me? Is this slander? Is this a lie? You have to interrogate that to see if it's tearing down your relationship with God, your family, your marriage, your church, or with authority. We need to be very careful as we interrogate that we do not accept condemnation. Let me explain the difference between condemnation and conviction. We believe in Holy Spirit conviction. Condemnation is, it, it, let, let's start with conviction. Conviction is never angry. God's not mad at you. Look at your neighbor, say, God's not mad at you. If God was mad at you, you'd be a grease spot. God loves you. So conviction is never angry, it's never threatening, and it's never hateful. It's always very kind, it's very specific, and it always offers help. You did this, it's gonna be okay, here's what you can do, Jesus will set you free. It's very, that's conviction. Condemnation is always general. You're not sure what happened. You're not sure exactly what you did. You just know it wasn't good. There's never a way out and there's never help. So condemnation is things like this. You're pathetic. See how, how general that is? You're pathetic. You're weak. Doesn't offer any help. Doesn't tell you why you're weak. It just says you're weak. You're pathetic. It says things like, how many times are you going to tell God that you're going to do something and then you don't? That's condemnation. The Bible says that we're not supposed to give ourselves to God. Listen to Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. Don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, so condemnation focuses on you. How weak you are, it focuses on us. Okay, grace focuses on Jesus. Never let the devil in your argument get it focused on you. Keep it focused on Jesus. So here comes the devil, he's arguing with you. He's telling you how bad you are. You just remind him, I'm okay because of Jesus. You're gonna catch on in a minute. Somebody say amen. amen. You have to understand it's not about you. Don't let the devil make it about you. Keep it about Jesus, amen. So the devil in his operation tries to accuse, slander, and divide. One of his favorite targets is our marriages. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4 26 listen to this I'm gonna help some of you married folks be angry you have a right to be angry there's such a thing as righteous indignation okay where there's something's wrong against God okay it's against demonic activity I can get mad at that but he says do not sin don't let the Sun go down don't go to your bed don't get in bed and go to sleep in your wrath that's that hateful anger that's that mad anger because it'll give place or territory, it opens up a door, it gives territory in your life to the devil, Diablos, amen. So here's what happens, you and your 
uh, husband or your wife, you have a fight, you're all upset, you go lay down, you get in bed, and you, what you don't realize is you just open the door. So while you're laying there in your sleep, your willpower is not engaged, you're not praying, you're sleeping. The devil doesn't care if you're sleeping. He slips in, he begins to work in your mind, he begins to work in your spirit, and he begins to accuse. Now you wake up the next morning feeling like you backslid. You don't even know what's going on, but you're upset with your wife. All day long you're fighting, you're fussing. This continues on. Pretty soon you've got these thoughts in your mind. You know, there's just something wrong with you. There's just something wrong with you. I married the wrong woman. I should have married Susie Longleg. I did not know I was marrying the devil's ex. There's nothing I can do to help my marriage until they change. Those are the thoughts. See, none of those thoughts are healthy. Those are, every one of those thoughts are divisive. They're taking you away from redemption. They're taking you away from health. And these are thoughts that happen because you went to bed angry. Now listen to me, amen. You, if you go to bed angry, you open that door. You open up to the, the devil to allow lies to come in you and you become what I call deviled. You're deviled. And so, so, so let me give you a little clue here, okay? If you wanna stop the devil from dividing your marriage, one of the best places to do it is right before you go to bed. Forgive them. Somebody say, forgive them. I don't care what they did. I don't care what's going on. I don't care if they forgive you, you forgive them. If you don't forgive them while you lay there, the Bible says that the devil will take territory in your life. That's what your Bible says. And the devil will begin to hunt you because you become the target and the prey. And at that moment, he has territory and every right to be there because you gave him the right. Reject thoughts that divide you from your church. There's a special anointing when we come together and get in God's presence. I mean, while the worship team was singing that song, I was in heaven, amen. I felt the presence of God. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together, in my name there am I in the midst of them. We are, we are living in the most evil day in human history, I believe. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10, that during these days, never forsake the assembling together of yourselves. But we should come together, we should exhort, bless, and strengthen one another. We should always speak a word of encouragement and, and uplift one another. How many of you know we need one another? If it hadn't have been for the church, I wouldn't have made it. Amen. The church has kept me alive. I've been able to come to church when I was beat up, tore up, disgusted, and broke, and God lifted me up. It's something about being in a church that is so powerful, so beautiful, and, it, and I believe that we ought to be committed to one another as much as Jesus is committed to us. We sometimes have to have faith, we sometimes have to have love, we sometimes have to have hope, but we've got to have each other, amen. And we work together. So the devil always wants to get you out of the church because he knows the banana that leaves the bunch gets skinned. He knows, amen. It's just like the horse that cuts the cow out from the herd. The cow that gets cut out gets branded or goes to Burger King. Amen. And so you got to understand the devil is constantly dividing your marriage, constantly trying to divide you from the church, constantly having you f feel things that aren't real and messing with your mind. The, the next place he'll try to divide you is from authority. The Bible says that when you are under authority, you're under covering. So it's like an, the Bible says if you have a, a, an ointment, a, a jar of ointment or anointing with no cover, the fly will get inside of it. You have to have a, a covering is not cramping your style. Covering is covering you and keeping you safe. Somebody say amen. amen. Now listen to this scripture. I want you to hear this scripture. This is going to really be good for you guys. Romans 13. Let every soul, that's, look at your neighbor, say, that includes you. Be subject to the governing authorities. Oh, amen, I'm going somewhere. There's no authority, none, zero authority, except from God. And all authorities, all of them, Trump, Pelosi, the president, the mayor, the pastor, that exist are they're appointed by God. Now that's your Bible. 
Therefore, whoever resists that authority, resists the ordinance of God. So every time you get on the social media and start trashing them, you're resisting the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. I'm trying to help the church here. I'm trying to help you. It might seem like it's a cool thing to do to trash Trump. You need to be careful. It might seem like the cool thing to do to trash the pastor. You need to be careful. You need to watch out what you're doing because the devil is constantly trying to say, yeah, look at what they're doing. Look at this. Look at that. It doesn't matter if they do good or bad. It matters that God appointed them. God can use a bad person to accomplish a good purpose. God used Hitler in his plan. Oh, amen. So we go around pointing at all this stuff, but God says all authority has been appointed by me. And when you resist any authority on any level, you've resisted me and it'll cause judgment to come to your life. So the devil constantly points at people making mistakes. We're all humans, we all make mistakes. Amen. There's no perfect person in here. If you're perfect, lift it. We all need Jesus. We've all been set free. We're only redeemed because of him. Somebody say amen today. Imperfect or not, authority comes from God. So the devil tries to get you out from underneath authority because when you come out from it, you are separated now and you're an open target for what he wants to do. So let me rephrase real quick. Then I'm going to get to my safari. The devil's a purpose is to accuse anybody or, or accuse God all the time. If God loved you, if God cared, if God did, he'll accuse to divide you, to pull you out. He'll accuse your marriage. He'll accuse your children. He'll accuse the parents to divide the family. He will accuse the church. The church should have done this. The church should have done that. How come they helped them, didn't help me? He'll accuse. He'll divide. He'll accuse you with authority. The Republicans, the Democrats, the, the hypocrites. I mean, it's never ending, folks. It's never ending because we live in an age that's very divisive right now because the devil is hunting right now. So we need to understand this. Now listen to what the Bible teaches us. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober. In other words, be in control of yourself. Be vigilant. Be very watchful. Very watchful. Very careful. Get that spear out. Interrogate every thought. Be very vigilant. Because your adversary, not just mine, it's yours too. The devil, he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may, not can, may devour. Can means he has the ability. If you're a Christian, he does not have the ability. But he may if you give him permission. If you start messing around, then he may have a right. If you give him territory, you go to bed angry, he may because you gave him permission. You talk against authority, he may because you gave him permission. Are you learning something today? Because your adversary, he's adversarial. He's not a nice guy. He walks about. In other words, he's looking to destroy. He's watching for mistakes that you have in your spirit. He's watching your attitude towards your pastor, your spouse, your husband, your kids. He's watching. He's watching for a mistake to take advantage of because he wants to devour you. The devil doesn't do lunchtime snacks. He doesn't lick you. He devours you. Amen. Okay. Now it's time. I have been, I have been on several African safaris, several times. And it's a funny thing that if you go to certain ones where there's lion prides and things like this, they will require you to sign a paper, a waiver, that if you get killed by an animal, that the campsite is not held responsible. Yeah, we call that a vacation. I've had several guides. The guides that take you out on these trips, they're not afraid of the animals, but they respect the animals. They understand the animal. So I need you to understand the animal tonight, today. They understand how it functions. First of all, lions are nocturnal. Lions are nocturnal. In other words, in the daytime, you're pretty well safe. A lion probably lay right there where the instruments are at. They just yawn, lay around. Lions about 20 hours a day sleep. But the other four hours of the day or night, they hunt. You really don't want to be out when they're hunting. Amen. 
So I was staying at this particular campsite, and I'm trying to explain it to you. There was a rotunda, a large area, where we would eat dinner and breakfast, and it was down the other side of that wall. It was down there. Then in a half circle, there were bungalows, or little rooms where we all stayed at nighttime. Each of those rooms had one light bulb, a toilet, running water, and a bed. That's it. No telephone, no internet, nothing like that. So we're, we're told to stay in our bungalows unless the guide comes. One evening, it's just about dusk, we are pulling out of the campsite. I had a friend there, and we was driving out in a Jeep, and as we was driving out, the headlights went into a bush, and I saw a leopard. The leopard was down in this bush and he was looking at something, his tail was twinkling, he was ready to charge. I glanced over and next to the end bungalow were two little children outside playing. That leopard was getting ready to have dinner. So we pulled in between the leopard and that last bungalow and, and yelled for the parents to come out who were, happened to be Canadians. They come outside and we told them there's a leopard about to eat your children. At that point, all the Canadians are outside, leopard, leopard, leopard. And they're, they're saving their children. So now I know, because that daytime I'd seen the lions, and now I'd seen the leopards. Now we was told to stay inside of our bungalow until the guide come to get us and take us down to eat dinner. The dinner was supposed to be at, I think it was seven o'clock. I'm not even sure what time it was, but whatever time it was. It started to rain, it was raining, it was a light drizzle. And so seven o'clock they didn't show up. 7.15, Brother Ray's hungry. Amen. I'm outside the bungalow looking around like, what, what, where, where's the guy at? Where's the guy at? Go back inside, start praying because I don't want to be divisive. 7.30, I'm back outside. Where is the guy? Man, I'm starving. 7.45, he still ain't there. 8 o'clock, he's still not there. So at 8 o'clock, I decided, look, that bungalow ain't that far. Ain't that far. So I got my umbrella. And I started out, I didn't get from me to Christian in the front row. I'm talking about in these safaris, listen, there's no, there's no street lights out there. It's pitch black. It's drizzling, it's rain, and I heard something in the bush. <laughs> now, I don't know what it was. <laughs> but I can tell you, I took that umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> they told me. Whatever you do when a wild animal comes, don't run. Can I tell you, I forgot all about that rule. <laughs> Brother Ray was running with all of it, but that animal had to catch me. I got down there, they said, what are you doing? You're an idiot. There's a whole pride of lions up there. I believe to this day, the only reason that lion didn't eat me, because the lion said, we don't eat idiots. <laughs> I don't, I'm telling you, I heard a lion out there. It scared me to death, and we made it. I, I, got, I got to keep moving here. Listen to me. The point I'm trying to make, it's dangerous at nighttime. It's dangerous in the dark. You know what darkness is in the Bible? Ignorance. Whenever you're ignorant, it's dark. There's no revelation. And wherever you're ignorant, the devil can hunt. Oh, amen. That's why we're supposed to come to church and stay in the light. We need to hear pastors like Pastor Marco and these guys preaching revelation to us so that the light can come on and we can catch on. Amen. We need to understand the devil is hunting us. And wherever it's dark, you don't have a right to go out there and think that you're something special. You get in his, you can't cast the devil off of what is his. Or if you give it to him, it's his. Does that make sense? Whatever, whatever you surrender to him is his rightful domain. You can't cast him out of something that you like. You like the darkness and he gets to hunt there. And so you need to understand, that. stay in the light. Everybody say, stay in the light. <laughs> Second of all, lions are paravisual. Let me try to explain that to you. Um, we went out every night in a military vehicle. It had four wheels on this side, four is like a big, I don't know what that thing is, it looked like a big boat. And they cut the top off of it and it had benches inside of it and then a metal pole on each corner. The guides would stand up and hold on to the poles and spotlight at nighttime. So you go out and see the animals. Actually, it's nighttime is a lot funner because you get to see all the kills, you get to see the hyenas and all those things. And it's, it's just neat at nighttime. So, so we go out there. Now, what's amazing to me is here comes the lions. Lions are big and they walk right up next to the vehicle. That lion could jump right in that vehicle. First time I saw him coming out of the bush, I said, hey, guy, hey, psst, psst, lions. Psst, psst. 
And he said, you don't have to worry about them. I said, what do you mean we don't have to worry about them? He said, they won't kill us. Because lions don't see the way you see. Lions don't see you as one person, a bunch of little people in there. They see one big vehicle. They see the whole, the whole object. They see a big truck. It's too big for them to kill and it doesn't smell good. It's not attacking their children and it's not taking their territory. There's no threat as long as you stay in the vehicle. Now those cats, just like a, a house cat, you know how a house cat will graze up, push up against you and, and, and make those noise? Those cats did the same thing to these big trucks. They would rub up against the truck and like purr. The crazy thing is, after a day or two of that, you kind of get used to it. You just forget, oh look, here come the lions, aren't they cute? <laughs> you forget about it. And so one Japanese brother just decided, you know what, my homies need to see this picture. And he jumped out of the vehicle to take a picture. The next pictures we took of him getting eat. Them lions had him for dinner. Uh-huh. Instantly attacked because he was outside. Perry Vision, all of a sudden, he was an individual. Now, what is the vehicle we have? The church. This is our vehicle. Long as you stay in the church, you're safe. As long as Jesus is in the middle of us, we're too big to eat and too big to attack. Amen. But you get outside the church and you smell like Burger King. Amen. And that lion will hunt you. That lion will come. The Bible says that we need to two or three to gather together. We need to stay in the crowd. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So here's another thing crazy about those lions. They use the vehicle as stealth. So in other words, like there's a bunch of impalas or antelope or something up there. Them lions will spot them, and then they come in on the backside of that vehicle, and they, they walk along like this, and they sneak and look out. They're looking for the one little impala that ain't in the group. And as soon as there was one that's outside, they'll slip around this side, charge and kill them. The devil will do the same thing. He's waiting for you to slip out. He'll, he'll hide right here in the church. There are wolves among us and wolves outside of us. Thank God you got a wolf pastor. He will hunt for wolves amongst the sheep. Amen. Well, well let's, let, let me, I don't want to preach on the wolf pastor right now. We'll come back another day. Lions are third of all territorial. You know, when you see uh, National Geographic and stuff, I'm not a zoologist, but I've studied a little bit on this. Lions, when they roar up like that, they're either looking for a mate or they're doing something. But when a lion's looking for territory, a lion roars into the ground. So when you get over there, you see them, they'll roar right at the ground. Now, the reason the lion roars at the, into the ground is because it causes a reverberation for about a quarter mile and every snake in the area will leave. So the lion is possessing territory. To him, it's all about territory. The guides had warned us, whenever an animal is looking for territory, you never run. Don't run. Stay perivisual. Stay in the vehicle. Stay together. And so they, the, the guides all had these guns, and the guide even told me one day, he says, uh, Genesis 9-2 says, God put the fear of man on all animals. Okay, and so the animals are, are actually kind of afraid of you, unless it's my neighbor's pit bull. He's not afraid of nobody. <laughs> so one day, this true story, I'm out there, I'd taken a lady with me, she's very, very old, her nurse is with her, she always wanted to go on a safari, so I'd taken her. I had another guy there, there was a photographer, myself, and the guide. We're walking through the woods, we're going down because we know on the other side of the river there's a bunch of elephants, we're gonna take pictures. All of a sudden, right in front, I mean from here again to the front row, a tree that big around goes flying through the air. Just a tree, a tree goes. And all of a sudden you hear this trumpeting and this noise and a big rogue bull elephant pops out. He's got his ears out, he's in full charge mode, he's trumpeting, he's screaming, he's grabbing brush, throwing it all around. What had happened is he got kicked away from the, the herd, the matriarch or somebody decided he was too old to perform. So he's mad. He ain't got no fam no more. Second of all, he's got musk running down his head. That means he's triple mad. The brother's upset and he's coming right at us, he's right at us. So the guide looks at me, I'm in a white t-shirt. And the guide says, you run that way. <laughs> he was going to offer up me to the elephant gods. <laughs> he knew that elephant would chase me. I said, you can have my church shirt. You give me the gun. He said, the gun only got rubber bullets. 
we got a gun with rubber bullets. Here's a big old elephant out here about ready to charge. Well, I don't know what happened, but naturally somehow we got in a line behind the guy. And the, the guide, when the elephant snorted forth like that, he clapped his hands. When he clapped his hand, the elephant stopped. He wasn't sure what to do. He's looking at us. And he trumpeted again, grabbed another tree, threw it out, and kind of stepped forward again like he was in a charge. And, and, and at that point, I knew that we had to go back to the, to the bungalows because I needed to change my clothes. <laughs> It was terrifying, man. I got to tell you, I was scared. that was scary. I've been in some fights, but that was scary. You don't beat them things. That thing's huge. And there he was. He's, he's trumpeting at us. He's coming. We clapped again. And the elephant wasn't sure what to do, and he walked away. My point is this. The, the, what they're after is territory. Everybody say territory. So, so the purpose of a lion's roar, the reason he roars at you with these thoughts and the reason he tries to get you angry because he can get territory. The reason he tries to get you to talk against authority, to, to talk against, he's after territory. He's hunting in your life, and that's what he's doing. Now listen to what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7. I'm almost done. Listen to this. God has not given. Everybody say, he has not given. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> Us a spirit of fear. God never gave you one. But he gave you power and love and a sound mind. The roaring lion is a spirit of fear. Now, really quickly, there's good fear. Good fear is always temporary, uh, it's productive, and it's circumstantial. For example, you're driving home today, somebody cuts the car in front of you, you slam the brake, your heart, oh, that's good fear. It protects you, it goes away once the driver goes away after you yell at him for a minute, and then everything's good. <laughs> Amen. Bad fear is chronic and debilitating. Just eats at you. God has not ever given you that kind of fear. There's a fear of the Lord. That's a respect. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about a fear. No baby is ever born with fear. No baby is born with fear. But a baby is born with love. Okay? And so fear is a demonic spirit. It's a demonic spirit. It's the devil roaring an argument into your mind. It's a demonic spirit to control you. It's after your territory. It's after your promised land. It's after whatever God has decided to give you. The devil's objective with fear, listen carefully, this is the best part of the sermon, is to get you to own it as if it was yours. It's a spirit. It's the devil. He wants you to own it like it's your fear. I'm afraid of. I had a person the other day tell me, uh, I'm so afraid of flying. I'd love to go with you on a missions trip, but I'm so afraid of flying. I just vomit at the thought. Truth is, they probably, their, their promise, their territory, their assignment in life, their destiny is probably hooked to travel. That's why the devil put the fear there and got them to say, it's mine. It's my fear. It's not your fear. God never gave you no fear. It's a spirit. Well, I'm afraid, I, I, I'm afraid of being in the discipleship class. What if they ask me to take the microphone? What if people don't like me? What if I look stupid? You do not have fear. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have any fear. God did not give you that fear. That's a spirit. You have taken ownership of it and said it's yours. And that's what the devil does to control you, to keep you away from your very destiny. To keep you away from the place. Are, is this making sense to anybody? He wants you to think it's you, but it's not you, it's him. Amen. Amen. It's a demonic spirit. Say it's a demonic spirit. It's after my territory. So the lion roars into the ground. It rumbles. You look at your kid. Your kid's acting crazy. Your husband's acting nuts. He, the, here comes the thoughts. You got to get the spear and interrogate that thought. Is that dividing me? Where's that taking me? What's going on? And that the lion is hunting. He's watching to see if you'll bring the spear out because he won't approach if you got the spear out. Amen. Amen. 